follow your natural inclinations and be tormented by an incubus of the conscience. Hello, everyone. My name is Joseph Sulia, S-U-G-L-I-A, and I will be lecturing today on Essay 2 of On the Genealogy of Morality, a Polemic, Zur Genealogie der Moral, eine Streitschrift by Friedrich Nietzsche. And the dominant questions of Essay 2 are the following. This is my own language. Number one, how are responsible subjects constructed? That is number one. How are responsible subjects constructed? Number two. Secondly, how is it that irresponsible, unrestrained, untrammeled subjects come into the world? Once more, number one. Question number one. How are responsible subjects constructed? Number two. How is it that irresponsible, unrestrained, untrammeled subjects come into the world? So there is a new typology that is set up in SA2. There is on the one hand, the reactive human animal, and on the other hand, there is the spontaneous human animal. Let me begin by discussing the reactive human beast. What is the reactive type? What is the reactive human beast? Well, the reactive type is someone who is obligated to keep promises. This is a kind of person who is geared not towards the past, but towards the future. The point is that the reactive human being is trained to keep promises and thus is turned into a servile, subservient, manipulated, and manipulable herd animal. Okay, so this is the reactive human type. The reactive human beast, the reactive human being, is trained, manipulated into obeying the norms of culture and the laws of society, right? The norms of culture and the laws of society. Whatever society that might be, whatever culture that might be, right? So if I am a reactive human animal, I must keep my promises in the future. Remember, the reactive human beast is geared towards the future. And I, if I am the reactive type, I am geared towards the future. I must keep my promises in the future. I will have been obligated. I will have been obligated. I promise to avoid transgressing social laws. I promise to avoid transgressing cultural norms. And it is incumbent upon me to do so. So how do society and culture train the individual subject to be submissive, subordinate, servile, subjudgeable, obedient? How do society and culture compel the reactive type to obey their laws and norms? By imprinting their laws and norms on the body of the human animal right? By imprinting their laws and their norms upon the body of the human animal. All human beings are animals, right? All human beings are animals. Justice, in quotation marks, is implemented by means of punishment. Hideous techniques of torture have been employed for centuries to inculcate plebeian morality within the human subject, the reactive human subject. The scar of I don't want to. Ich will nicht. I don't want to do it. Essay 2, paragraph 3. This, this slogan, this scar, I don't want to do it, is indelibly imprinted in the body and in the memory by means of torture. I don't want to steal because if I steal, somebody is going to torture me. That is what I think unconsciously. That is what my body knows. If I steal, I will be tortured. This is imprinted in the minds of reactive human beings for centuries. I will be tortured because my thieving ancestors were tortured, right? Centuries of torture, 
Centuries of religious cruelty, centuries of legal cruelty have evolved the responsible human subject. Nietzsche is a forerunner of evolutionary psychology as we know it today. So why is it that we feel the chill of apprehension when we enter a dark, unknown space, a cavernous space? Why is that? Because our ancestors lacked artificial illumination. They lacked artificial coruscation, right? Why are so many of us afraid of snakes, even though the preponderance of snakes are non-venomous? Because our ancestors were ophidiophobes, right? They were afraid of snakes, perhaps for good reason. We are afraid of certain things because our ancestors were afraid of certain things. And our fears, our phobias, our desires, our inclinations have been passed down to us, have been bequeathed to us. We have inherited the feelings, the emotional states of our ancestors, our predecessors. Again, centuries of religious cruelty and legal cruelty have trained us to be good, in quotes, docile subjects. Keep your promise to be lawful or you will be tortured. Generations of human beings have been trained, manipulated, programmed, brainwashed to think in this reactive fashion. So the reactive type unconsciously, physically, corporeally, knows the logic of equivalence between transgression and penalty. And this is a quote from the text, a direct quotation. The idea of equivalence between injury, he means to society, and pain. Essay 2, paragraph 4. This again, this is the idea of equivalence between injury to society and then a penalty. This is ingrained in our minds. In other words, if you transgress the law, you will suffer a penalty. But the body of the human animal is trained to know this, right? It is a physiological knowledge. It is, a, it is a bodily knowledge. It's not unconscious. I'm sorry. It's not a conscious knowledge. It is an unconscious knowledge. So a relationship between creditor and debtor is installed. The reactive human being, the reactive human beast, is the debtor. Society is the creditor. So Turn the subject into a debtor. Turn, turn the reactive subject into someone who is perpetually in debt. To what? To whom? To society. The debtor, the reactive human type, is one who owes society. One who is responsible for paying back to society what one owes, right, in the imagination in the collective imagination. Now, I'm thinking, for example, of military conscription in which young people are willing to pay the ultimate debt to the societies into which they were born, or perhaps are unwilling to pay the ultimate debt to the societies in which they were born. I'm thinking as well of taxation. I'm thinking of suffrage, census completion, volunteerism, civil service, what have you. I am thinking also of the ideology that expects the young to become married and to produce a family. So the human animal, the reactive human type, right, is perpetually in debt to society. And the word for debt in German is schuld, right? Schuld, which means as well, guilt. Word for debt in German, schul, also means guilt. So the reactive obedient subject, the reactive obedient subject is instilled with a consciousness of guilt, the memory of guilt, and is forced into the position of debtor, the one who is indebted to the laws of society and the norms of culture. Thus, the feeling of guilt is what powers the responsible subject to follow the laws of society. 
and the norms of culture. You will feel guilty if you do not do so. You will feel guilty if you do not do what society expects you to do. You will feel guilty if you do something that's considered to be odd culturally, right? You're strange, you're weird. You should feel guilty about that. What does it mean to be weird? It means not to follow the norms of culture, right? Not to adhere to the values of culture. And the reactive human beast, the one who's afraid of being weird, one who's afraid of being branded as weird, nominated as weird, is forced into the position of debtor. The one who is indebted, again, to the laws of society and the norms of culture. Thus, the feeling of guilt is what powers the responsible subject to follow the laws of society. And the norms of culture, you will feel guilty if you do not do so. And the feeling of guilt is the affective mark, affective with an A, of the indebtedness of the responsible subject to the society to which one belongs. You're in debt. You are owned by society. And the affective mark of that, again, affective with an A, the emotional mark of that is the feeling of guilt. The troubled conscience. Is the feeling of guilt, the feeling of indebtedness, connatural? Are we born with it? Is it congenital? Were we born with it? Or Nietzsche, it certainly is not. It is a feeling that is inculcated within us after centuries of breeding. Who invented guilt? Well, Nietzsche gives us an answer to this question rather late in the second essay. It was the person of resentment who invented guilt. That's who invented guilt. The person of resentment invented guilt. The reactive sentiment par excellence, justice by contrast comes from the active individual, not from the reactive type. Justice comes from the active individual to whom we shall soon return, not from the person of resentment, who is seething with the lust for revenge. Now, Nietzsche has changed his mind about justice. This needs to be said. In Ozo sprach Zarathustra, and thus spoke Zarathustra, which was written and published between 1883 and 1885, Nietzsche believes that justice is the sublimation of revenge. So justice is nothing more than another name for revenge. Justice is the exaltation of revenge. Justice is the glorification of revenge. It is the elevation of revenge. But basically, justice is revenge, right? According to the Nietzsche of also Sprach Zarathustra. Now, this is a different book. In this book, on the genealogy of morality, a polemic, justice is not just another name for revenge, as it is in Also Sprach Zarathustra. Strangely, in 1887, when this book was published, Nietzsche no longer believes this. Nietzsche has changed his mind. His thought has undergone a change. In 1887, with On the Genealogy of Morality, a polemic, his thought has undergone a change. So the 1887 Nietzsche does not think that justice is derived from the sphere of resentment, from the sphere of revengefulness, right? Now, if you have not yet watched and listened to the first video in the series, just stop the tape, go back, watch, watch my video on essay one, because I speak about this at length. But what I want to say is this. The person of resentment invents guilt and the bad conscience, not justice. Again, justice is invented by the spontaneous, active, productive, self-productive individual. I will return to that later on, but I want to, I want to still talk about the reactive type. How is indebtedness to society enforced? 
How is the reactive subject made responsible? Remember my first question. How are responsible subjects fashioned? How are they constructed? Well, the self-responsible subject will be discussed later. That's the spontaneous individual. No, I want to talk about the reactive type. The reactive subject is, again, not the self-responsible subject. Now, when the criminal breaks one's promise to society, the consequence is punishment. When the criminal breaks a law, the consequence is pain, or at least the consciousness of pain. The origin of the concept of responsibility is blood. Let me say that again. The origin of the concept of responsibility is blood. The history of responsibility is drenched, bedraggled, draggled, supersaturated with blood. If you do violence to the creditor, which is society, you are not keeping your promise. And the penalty is pain. The penalty is pain. So first, it is corporeal pain, right? Bodily pain, physical pain. But then the pain will become psychological. If you break your promise, you will feel pain. This is the equation that is burned into our minds. It's inscribed into our minds. It's branded into our minds. This is the message that is indelibly burned into the mind of the responsible, reactive subject. But also, also the legislators and the administrators of pain, right? The judges, the jailers, the police, the legislators. The legislators of pain. The administrators of pain must take pleasure in inflicting pain in order for the programming of the responsible subject to be effective and complete. Now, why is this? Well, one of the motivations for human behavior is the desire for pleasure. There's also such a thing as pleasure in pain. The creditor takes pleasure in exacting repayment for the de- from the debtor. The creditor takes pleasure in exacting repayment from the debtor, right? The debt collector experiences pleasure in collecting the debt. The creditor takes pleasure in inflicting the pain of punishment. If there were no pleasure, the system of justice would fall apart. The pain that is inflicted on the responsible subject is not the effect, with an E, of an act of revenge. It is a positive, active, formative pleasure in the spectacle of suffering. So, the judge experiences pleasure when he or she meets out punishment, when he or she inflicts pain. Judiciary pleasure comes from the eroticization of pain. Or to put it another way, judiciary pleasure comes from the sexualization of pain. The pain of the criminal who is the promise breaker. This is Nietzsche's a priori supposition, and it runs throughout all of his works. This is a premise. Now, you might dispute this premise, and that's fine. But what I'm giving you here is an axiom. This is Nietzsche's axiom. This is Nietzsche's ultimate premise. No, it's it's his fundamental premise. Human beings have an appetite for cruelty. All people, all human beings have an innate taste for cruelty. You might disagree with this. That's fine. But this is Nietzsche's ultimate. I said it again. This is Nietzsche's fundamental premise. We can see this in the love that so many have for horror films. We can see this in the love that so many have for tragedies, for tragic dramas. We can see it in the crucifixion of Christianity. You can see it in the crucifixion of Christianity. We can see this in the crucifixion of thousands of slaves in Roman antiquity. We can see it in the Roman circus. 
We can see it in Toromachi, a bullfight, right? We can see it in televisual sadism. You see it in internet sadism, which is all over the internet. Think of the televisual sadism of reality television, right? We can see it in videographic sadism, in, in the uh, fail videos, cringe videos, so-called. On YouTube, which have millions of views, go and look them up if you don't believe me. Why else is it that so many judges, legislators of pain, take delight in the misfortune of others? Think of the police. Why is the spectator so often a malicious, spiteful spectator? Again, why is it that the spectator is so often a malicious, spiteful spectator? Why is that? Well, I've suggested this before, but human beings are not merely pleasure seekers. Though we are, though we are. Human beasts are pain seekers as well. We are not just pleasure seekers. We are also pain seekers. There is a festive atmosphere that surrounds the punishment of the criminal. As Nietzsche writes in Essay 2, Paragraph 6, no cruelty, no feast. Ohne Grausamkeit, kein Fest. The reactive type of human, however, turns the impulse to be cruel against itself, against oneself. Let me say it again. The reactive type of human, however, turns the impulse to be cruel against oneself. So the drive towards cruelty is, re is reintrojected, is re internalized, is re-interiorized by the reactive type. The reintrojection of cruelty, which is naturally directed outwards, right, conduces to the invention of the soul, which is the imaginary seat of, you guessed it, the bad conscience, which is also imaginary. Permit me to quote the text directly. So this is what Nietzsche writes in paragraph 16 of the second essay. Let me read it in English and then in German. All, this is a quote, paragraph 16 of the second essay. All instincts that are not discharged outwardly turn inwards. This is what I call the internalization of man. With it, there now evolves in the human being what will later be called its soul. Let me read the German now. Alle Instinkte, welche sich nicht nach außen entladen, wenden sich nach innen. Dies ist das, was ich die Verinnerlichung des Menschen nenne. Damit wächst erst das an den Menschen heran, was man später seine Seele nennt. Soul is in quotation marks. So, the bad conscience is the spiritualization of torture. The bad conscience is the spiritualization of torture, or to put it another way, the psychologization of torture, right? The impulse to enjoy spectacles of cruelty is transformed into self-torment, which is legitimated as the bad conscience. This is how the responsible subject is constructed. We finally have reached at this point. Listen. This is how responsible subjects are constructed. The reactive types are trained, disciplined, manipulated into feeling that they owe everything to society, right? The responsible reactive type is programmed and indoctrinated into fulfilling one's imaginary debts to society. Now, again, the criminal is the one who breaks the promise to society, the irresponsible passive subject. The criminal is the one who breaks his promise to society to be a responsible, passive subject. 
But why do the police have no bad conscience about what they do? Now, as Nietzsche points out, quite rightly, the police and police detectives spy, they dupe, they bribe, they set traps, they deceive. Um, This is elaborated in essay two, paragraph 14. I mean, think of it this way. The police officer who is interrogating you will pretend to be your friend. Oh, you know, this is not a big deal and we can handle it. Just just tell me what happened. And well, it's it's nothing. It's 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 just a very small thing. We'll take care of it. Just tell me what happened. The police officer will play the role of the good cop and the, the role of the bad cop. But the police use deceptive techniques all of the time. All of the time. Both criminals and the police are two sides of the same paper takeout menu. Both criminals and the police are attracted to the same thing. Criminality, right? And both use criminal tactics, to say it again. It is just that the police are able to use criminal tactics with impunity, with legitimacy, right? So the spontaneous sovereign individual emerges at the final stage of society he or she is the is to quote the text the ripest fruit on the tree, reist of hooked an irim baum. Essay two, paragraph two. So the reactive type is disciplined and manipulated until the sovereign individual blossoms. Right, the final stage of society and the final product of society is the blossoming of the autonomous sovereign individual. Who or what is the sovereign individual? Well, let's talk about it. Who is the sovereign individual? One moment. So we're done with the reactive individual. Well, not the reactive type. We could say the reactive individual, right? The reactive passive subject, right? Now I want to talk about the spontaneous, self-responsible, productive, sovereign, individual. Okay, let's talk about him or her. The spontaneous, sovereign individual is self-responsible, self-mastered, and a self-legislator, right? So the sovereign individual is auto-legislator, right? What do I mean? One makes laws and then might choose to follow those laws. But only the sovereign individual is permitted to follow these laws, right? No one else is permitted to follow the laws. The reactive type is commanded to follow the laws, right? The the reactive type is coerced into following the laws. But only the sovereign individual is allowed, permitted, to follow the laws or to forbear from following. Them. So in other words, the sovereign individual might choose not to follow the laws that one creates. The sovereign individual is not moral, but also is neither immoral nor amoral. No, 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 no. The sovereign individual is extra moral, right? That is outside of conventional plebeian morality, beyond good and evil, right? Think of the artist. The artist is a sovereign individual, is the sovereign. Anyway, now the spontaneous autonomous human being is not obligated to keep promises, certainly not to society, certainly not to culture. The spontaneous human being is alone a promising human being, right? Only the spontaneous human being is allowed to make promises. It's not just about keeping them. The spontaneous human being doesn't just keep promises. No, no, no. The spontaneous human being makes promises. Promises are made for the reactive type. Memories are made for the reactive human being, the human beast. The reactive human beast is obligated to keep promises, whereas only the spontaneous, sovereign, self-mastered, autonomous human being 
is authorized to make promises. I hope this is clear. You see that there's a new typology that is being set up. So in essay one, we had a certain typology. It was there is good versus bad, and then good versus evil, right? This is a different typology. This is a different. We learn at the beginning of the second essay that the human animal is the only animal that is bred in order to have the right to make promises. To quote the opening directly, this is a quote, to breed an animal that is permitted to make promises. Is this not exactly the paradoxical task which nature has set up for itself in relation to humankind? Is this not the proper problem of humankind? Let me read it in the German. Let me read the German. Ein Tier heranzupten, das versprechen darf. Ist das gerade nicht, nein, ist das nicht gerade jene paradoxe Aufgabe selbst, welche sich die Natur in Hinsicht auf den Menschen gestellt hat, ist es nicht das eigentliche Problem von Menschen. So Nietzsche is not alluding to the common react of human being here, right? In the opening of essay two. No, no, no. He is alluding to the sovereign human individual. That is to say the sovereign individual human being is the only animal that is authorized to make promises. The only animal that is entitled to make promises. Only the sovereign individual has the prerogative to make promises, whereas the reactive type has no such privilege. You see, if I am the sovereign individual, only I have the prerogative. Only I have the self-given authority to make promises. Anyway, the sovereign individual blocks out, shuts out the memory of plebeian morality. So the reactive type is, is, has a memory of what he or she is supposed to do, nonetheless is geared towards the future, right? Promises that must be kept. We talked about that already. This is what Nietzsche calls, uh, you know, the, the forgetting. Let me, let me start again. The sovereign individual blocks out, shuts out the memory of plebeian morality. This is what Nietzsche calls the activa vergesslichkeit, active forgetfulness. So oblivion, forgetfulness, amnesia is not a negative or passive faculty for Nietzsche, not at all. When you're eating a cheeseburger, while, while you're eating a cheeseburger, do you think intensely of the cow that you are devouring? <laughs> when you're eating a cheeseburger, why, well, it's bad English, sorry. While you are eating a cheeseburger? Probably not, probably not, which is why French Latin is used in English to camouflage what we are eating, right? Um, you know, people often say pork, which is French Latin, poisson, right? It's French Latin. They don't usually say things like, I'm eating a pulled pig flesh sandwich, right? They don't, they don't use the Anglo-Saxon German, right? They don't say things like pig flesh, which would be closer to the German, Schweinefleisch. Anyway, we do not say that we are eating cow flesh, which would be German, which has a much closer proximity to the reference. We say that we are eating beef. Beef is French Latin which camouflages the reality of what we are ingurgitating, right? Forgetting is an active faculty that permits us to ignore the disagreeableness of reality and hence to live. And hence to live. Forgetting allows us to live. Now, let us remember that morality is dependent on memory, right? According to the Nietzsche of Daybreak, if you've read Daybreak uh, in German, Morgenröte, Gedanken über die moralischen Vorurteile, Daybreak, thoughts on moral prejudices. To be moral, 
you have to have a good memory. You, you can't be a moral person if you have a bad memory. And if your mnemonic faculties are defective, how could one expect you to be moral, right? We are given an armamentarium of mental and physical faculties, right, by nature. And whether or not we are moral depends on the congenital equipment that we have been given. So if you're not gifted with, um, you know, certain mental and physical equipment, how could you be expected to be moral? There's a great deal to say about that, but I don't want to get, get off target. Um, the sovereign individual is voluntarily oblivious, right? Remember, the solitary individual voluntarily actively forgets. So the sovereign individual is a voluntarily oblivious and actively forgetful beast who can suspend forgetfulness when that individual chooses to make a promise. Again, it is not incumbent upon the sovereign individual to keep any promise, not at all. This is also known as the I shall do it of the sovereign individual, right? The I shall do it is an original, active, formative process. It, it, put it another way, it, it's an original formative act. It is antithetical, antipodal to the Kantian, you must do it, you Zoltist, you have to do it of Kant, right? The you have to do it of Kant's categorical imperative. The sovereign individual says, in effect, I will make a promise and I will keep a promise if I choose to do so. The promising sovereign individual is not reactive, but active. He or she wills to obey or not, right, or not. But then again, he or she might, might will not to obey. The sovereign individual might will not to obey. The self-master, spontaneous individual actively wills, actively desires. He or she has what Nietzsche calls a will to remember, right? Ein Gedecknis des Willens, essay two, paragraph one. He or she alone has the will to not invent a law. That's important. The sovereign individual is accountable to no one but oneself. He or she is emancipated, liberated, free from conventional plebeian morality. The sovereign individual has an instinct for freedom. Instinct der Freiheit in German, essay two, paragraph 18. Now let's say a few words about the artist So as far as the artist is concerned, as far as the artist is concerned, the artist, the genuine artist is a sovereign individual. The artist is free from the manacles of conventional plebeian morality. Everyone knows this. Artists are weightless, irresponsible, guiltless, and not afflicted by the bad conscience or the spirit of revenge. Der Geist der Schwere. Hmm? Now, Milan Kundera, a Nietzschean novelist, derives his conceit of the unbearable likeness of being from Nietzsche. Hammond Hesse and D.H. Lawrence are also Nietzschean novelists. Hesse is Kundera's superior, and Lawrence is Hesse's superior. Anyway, artists practice violence. They do. Artists practice violence, but not violence in the literal sense of the word. No. Artists discharge creative violence. They release stylistic violence in their works of art. Art is beyond good and evil. Art is beyond good and evil. Art is extra moral. See essay two, paragraph 17. Whereas the reactive type is like a non-holonomic robot, that is programmed to be responsible, the spontaneous individual might choose to be responsible, right? Might choose to be responsible. The sovereign spontaneous individual exercises the privilege of self-responsibility. One is the legislator of value. One is the legislator of value. The sovereign individual is. Now, if you have seen and listened to the first video of the series, or if you've read essay one, you will know that there are, again, two inversions in the first essay, right? Good becomes evil, 
and bad becomes good. Now, in the second essay, there is also an inversion, a reversal, right? Firstly, at the reactive stage of humankind, society is above the individual, right? Secondly, with the appearance of the spontaneous individual, the individual is above society. Yes, the sovereign individual is now situated above society. But has this time come yet? No, it has not. The sovereign individual affirms the will to power from an extra moral point of view. But it is not yet time to speak of the will to power. That will have to wait for a future video. Thank you very much. I hope you found this interesting. I certainly did. <laughs> I did. Even if you didn't, I certainly did. And I thank you, though, for watching and listening. My name is Joseph Sulia, S-U-G-L-I-A. And this is the second video in the series in which I discuss Zor Geniologie de Morale and Estrade Schrift on the genealogy of morality, a polemic. And the third and final video will concern essay three. And that's my favorite essay of the entire book. It's, it's like a dessert. I know it's superficial. It's a very superficial thing to say, but I find it delightful. By essay three to be again my favorite of the three essays, and yet it's not taught very often. It's not read very often. This book is taught. It's been taught for years and years and years, but it's um, usually when this book is ground through the mill of the college and university system, students are expected to read essay one preface, essay one, and then essay two. But as far as I know, very few students are ever asked to read essay three. Anyway, um, I'm really looking forward to speaking about essay three. I invite you to join me. Again, this is Joseph Sulia signing out and signing off. Thank you very much.